I'm going to go ahead and call the, the meeting of the Coastal Pelagius Management Board to order. Uh, for those of you that are online, this is Spud Woodward, Georgia's governor's appointee commissioner and current chair of the Coastal Pelagics Management Board. Uh, our first, uh, quiet my microphone here, uh, first item of business is approval of the agenda. Are there any modifications or suggested additions to the agenda? Seeing none, and we'll consider the agenda accepted by unanimous consent. You also have the proceedings from the August 2024 meeting of this board. Are there any corrections, edits, modifications to those minutes? Any opposition to accepting those minutes as presented? Seeing none, we'll consider those accepted by unanimous consent. So this time uh, we open up for public comment on any items before this board that are not on the agenda. Is there any? public comment from anyone in the room don't see any anybody online uh, we don't have anybody online so we'll move quite along our uh, next item is an update on CDAR 95 which is our planned stock assessment for Atlantic migratory group COVID and I'm going to turn that over to Pat Campbell thank you mr. chairman um, this will be quick that you're is there a file we can put up or should we just skip that? All right. Um, in short, the uh, COBIA stock assessment through the CDAR process um, had started. Uh, it was scheduled for completion about a year from now, November of 2025. Um, on the pro side, a number of um, data webinars to look at life history data, indices, removals, uh, occurred over the summer and and showing progress and perhaps some new analytical or modeling uh, possibilities for uh, getting creative with COBIA stock assessment. However, uh, the lead analyst from uh, the National Marine Fishery Service and Southeast Science Center uh, that was assigned to COBIA uh, changed jobs and left NIMS. And so um, obviously that uh, puts a stop to the uh, next steps in the assessment and to begin the, the more rigorous analyses. Um, in short, the bottom line is the assessment will be delayed um, at least a year um, to be finished in late 2026 if we wait for a new analyst from NIMS um, with advice to you all um, to the management board in early 2027. Um, we recognize this is a significant delay, but with the loss of that lead analyst, uh, we're in a bit of a fix. Um, and I think I think that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Pat. Any questions for Pat? Uh, Joe Semino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. More of a comment. I, you know, we have several species that are highly recreational dependent. And as we talked about with black drum, um, you know, the importance of aligning these assessments with the new MREP data. I, I really don't see any value in, in pushing this assessment ahead of new recalibrated and peer reviewed MREP estimates. Um, I realize that puts us in a hell of a spot because, you know, I think the terminal year of the last assessment was 17, 18, I mean, we, we might potentially be looking at a, a decade out from the terminal year of the last assessment. And so with that said, I, I would fully support not fully going through the assessment and to, you know, to peer review until we get the recalibrated MRIP estimates. But if there's anything that the TC or stock assessment subcommittee could recommend as a way to kind of gauge where we are in the effort of this fishery um, and provide some management guidance, I, I would fully support that as well. I guess just to respond to that a little bit, um, I think the TC could, will have to meet um, in 2026 to talk about the 2027 through up to 2031 specs and in the past the TC has requested 
additional projections based on the old assessment from NOAA, but they weren't able to provide any. So I, the TC could talk about maybe some, you know, any analyses they could do in the interim, but I think it might be pretty limited. Yeah, I think everybody shares your frustration, Joe. I know that the, the demand seems to always exceed capacity. Uh, you know, we've created a pretty high demand process here and, and feeding it with timely, trustworthy information continues to be a, a challenge across the board. And, uh, you know, this one, unfortunately, seems to be falling into the same trap. But uh, I guess a question I'd have is, do we have any idea when it'll be staffed back up and the machine will, will go back to turning again? Yeah, thanks, Bud. Um, in communicating with Eric Williams at the Southeast Center in the last couple of weeks, um, they are going to put an announcement out. He said, you know, in about a month. Um, but we'll see how it goes from there. I think um, Eric's suggestion was about a year from now, fall of 2025, is when they would be hired, trained up, familiar with BAM and some of the other models that have been used for COVID before and might be able to plug into. The assessment process that would be the earliest he also uh, provided a caveat that it, it could take another six months after that depending on who they hire all right what's our latest forecast for the fes bias study results of possible i guess changes in catch estimates from the past do you have anything on that that might because i'm trying to get at what joe's talking about if we hit the pause button you know, how long is that pause going to, going to be and when when would it be realistic for this board to expect up, updated stock status information and, and corresponding catcher level recommendations based on, I'm not going to hold you to it, I'm not, not going to make you sign anything, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I, others around the room may, may have more authority certainly from NIMS, but I think my understanding is that pilot study will be finished, you know, late 2026, is that right? And so, you know, again, that'll be That'll be a while before the potentially changed MRIP numbers are out. So I guess the you know what it comes down to is what's, what's what's the comfort level, you know, in something like this. I mean, we don't have control over a lot of it, but what's our comfort level in terms of? And I think you know, as Emily was saying, I think your TC is going to struggle to, you know, the, the information that they'd be using to make projections is getting pretty doggone stale, and it's going to be a questionable value. So um you know we may not have a lot of choice in this matter but we may just be left at status quo for for a while but uh, i guess we'll we'll just see how this proceeds and and uh if we can get anything that helps us have a better context for where we are and where we need to be going we'll certainly try to do it so any uh any further questions or comments on this uh, lynn yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. It might be an aside, but I know we've talked around the policy board or the executive committee about the issues sort of globally with a dearth of stock assessment scientists. And I'm just kind of wondering if there's any um, inkling if, if this is going to be, do we have people coming out who are going to be, are they going to get good applicants? I mean, are we, I'm just, I'm just curious um, as this happens, if we, if we're finding people to come up and take these jobs. Yeah, I'll answer delicately that at least, you know, for the commission stock assessment scientists, um, we have a, a well-known, you know, pipeline or recruitment, various universities and um, population dynamics, uh, modeling labs that we recruit from. So it's been successful to date. I think all of the stock assessment enterprises, you know, on our coast around the country pull from similar locations, but there is a pipeline. It's not overly abundant, but it exists. All right, uh, John Carmichael. Yeah, thank you, Spud. And then on the FES, we got a presentation at the September council meeting and MREP says they're still on track to anticipate having the calibrated data finalized spring of 26. So completing the study, doing the analysis and then calibrating things as they need to. They're saying early 26, hopefully. So sounds like the timing of this assessment might be so close that you decide to wait and get that new information in there. I mean, if they're not going to have someone ready to even start on until 25, 
I would suspect that TC and others would at least want to advance the terminal year over where it is now. You don't want to go into the assessment three or four years behind. Thanks, John. Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, yeah, so the, the timing of the, um, kind of the, you know, the recreational information, I, I'm not kind of factoring that in here, but I wonder, um, so, you know, Lynn's comment, I thought was a good one. And I wondered, has there been a, an attempt? So if somebody left at no others, potentially a little slack in the budget there, I was wondering, could an RFP be put out to one of these universities just to have, you know, an assessment done um, in the interim here? They can usually operate pretty quickly if you kind of set the parameters up that way. Um, just trying to get creative here, that's a long time to go without an assessment and to use projections that are that old is not not great, so. Yeah, thanks for the creative suggestion and, and idea, Jay. That has, that has worked for other stock assessments. I think we did that in a similar fashion for Wheatfish a number of years ago. Um, I guess the, the question is who who pays for it? I don't know if we want to get into that uh, this afternoon, um, but I, we did ask uh, leadership within the Southeast Science Center, um, and at least for their um, responsibilities, they said they're fast tracking this replacement using their funds for those kind of stock assessment positions. Um, so that avenue has been answered, but I, we haven't explored it at the commission level uh, for a variety of reasons. I do have an offering plate up here. We can circulate around with the sign-in sheet if folks want to make a donation. You know, so, uh, but you know, it's it's a, it's a relevant question, and I think back to, to Lynn's uh, comments it, is it's not only the lead scientist, but it's all that supporting, you know, cast of characters it takes to, to pull off a CDR or one of those. I mean, that's the other that's the other limiting factor. You know, is that additional supporting capacity? Those folks are are. You know they're 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 working at pretty high capacity demand too so you know it's just it's, it's so we, we've set up a high demand system and we continue to struggle to feed it and it's just it means you got to make difficult priority decisions i know it's certainly at the federal level that's that's the case when you're dealing with multiple species and so um, i guess we'll see you know if if the science center is actually able to get somebody on staff expeditiously and this uh timeline that John described come it may just sink itself up and we may be left you know not in a desirable position but in a necessary position uh, by the aggregate of circumstances so any Bob yeah thank you mr just a, a question you know based on this conversation we'll go back and try to find some options right and is it is it a better outcome for the board if we do wait until the the recalibrated FES numbers are out and the new data is out in spring, or if there is an option, I don't know, a contractor or something in the interim, should we pursue that? In other words, what what's a better outcome? Or Because the, the concern is if we pursue a contractor of some sort, and I don't know where the funding comes from, and and that's completed, then, you know, and that's before the new data comes out through FES, then are we delayed? pick a number, three years until our next shot at this. Yeah, so I'm just trying to sort of figure out what road you want staff to go down to try to make something happen. I mean, I know there's there's pros and cons both ways, obviously, um, and waiting until 27, you know, a decade out from the last read we had on the stocks a long time. But um, I, don't, I don't want to push real hard on CDAR to try to, you know, find another assessment person or something to – to get this done early, but then the board's frustrated because it's we don't have the new data in there. So just trying to, I don't know, figure out which one we should chase down as staff. I, th I think we're all struggling with that because we, first of all, we don't know for sure when the FES bias study results and, and those calibrations are actually going to be delivered. So that's an uncertainty. And, um, you know, and then, okay, say we, we found the resources to do something now, well, we're still going to be plagued with uncertainty because of the time that has elapsed over 
you know, between the last assessment and the terminal years and all that. So, um, you know, I guess, I guess the real question is, is that if you find the resources, you do something now, you, you get, you get results, you get catch level recommendations, and then you may be facing changing them a year later, you know, based on updated catch information. So, you know, do you, hit your wagon to the science center hope they do the best they can and we get it as quick as we can and then if we have to go back and do something based on new data then it may fall to us to find the resources to do the update to the assessment in order to make sure that we have the most current information so i kind of, I'm kind of thinking maybe that but i'll certainly defer to the to the board uh lynn and then i'll go to jay yeah, somebody more steeped in assessment is going to correct me if I'm not thinking about this right. But it seems to me that given the length of time, and this is a benchmark assessment, it seems that the right thing to do is do whatever we can to get the benchmark completed, the methodology, because if the methodology is approved and the methodology is correct, then once those updated estimates come through, seems as though an update could occur and we don't know what that recalibration is going to look like maybe it'll result in some sort of scaling effect i mean i, I don't know but it seems like a, a benchmark is a big deal um and maybe the the better idea would be to get it going and then when those new data come in it might be a simpler matter just to run it as an update okay then I'll go to Doug. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not, so I'm on uh, Team Lynn on, on this one. I, I think I was having the, the same thought. You know, there's an attribute here to kind of creating the, the assessment. And um, we could be, you know, kind of prescriptive there if we think we could confer with the Science Center if there's like a type of assessment that they're sort of targeting. Um, you know, in their their assessment enterprise, we could say that that's the type of assessment that we want, and then th there's this attribute of it getting built um, ahead of time, which the tool will then be available moving forward. Um, and then we can also explicitly ask for explorations, of, you know, with regard to the recreational data. There's this you know, sentiment that there may be some bias one way or the other, and, and we, you know, put a term of reference in, in the RFP to say, we want you to, um, you know, look into that, confer with the, um, you, you know, the, the folks that, um, I, I'm blanking on the, the acronym, but the folks that run MRIP and, and kind of get a sense of, you know, hey, which way is the bias on a species like this would you think and and then have the person test uh you know in that direction so we get kind of a a sense of the effect of that but also then whatever the data looks like it can just get plugged in later so i like the idea of kind of pushing forward if there's a way to do it all right thanks jake doug and then i'll go to you joe thanks mr chairman i guess my question goes back several commenters and just to clarify we're not married to the southeast regional center being the lead right i mean if there's capacity within a state or the council or anywhere else i mean we're not married to feds waiting for them to hire somebody before we can restart right is there a reason why it has to be feds as lead Go ahead. that that has been you know, the pattern historically for, you know, Cobia and Spanish mackerel, Manhattan notably for the Southeast Center. Um, but it, it is up to you all. It's up to the, the board and the commission to decide if you want to deviate from that. Um, also in the context of the number of stock assessments that, you know, you all in the state and our assessment staff already support. That's a heavy workload already. Um, so it have to be really thought through if we want to add another assessment um, and take it out of the, the NIMS realm. Yeah, and I'm gonna play the devil's advocate here. Uh, if we release the Science Center from this 
partnership, then we might not ever get it back. So I think it may be important that we try to hold the line as much as we can and get them to continue to contribute in support uh, of, you know, our activities. Uh, but I guess at some point you have to make the hard decision, you know, is that, is that limiting to the point that it's putting us in an untenable position? So, uh, Joe. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't think we are, to, but one of the added expenses would be, if, you know, to go to that extent that we have done a few times of actually paying for an independent peer review and paying those folks for their time and all that, you know, it, it adds up quickly. Um, I, I guess I'm going to ask, uh, Pat, I'm going to ask you a question here. Uh, you know, I, I see this somewhat as a data poor species, right? I think if we did have fisheries independent data, um, we, we probably could have used some of that just as guidance, even without an updated assessment. Uh, we don't really have that. You, you mentioned that things were getting started. Do you, do you, do you have a feel of where this can go? Because to me, I wasn't even sure we would be passing peer review. So I, I very, very much appreciate Jay and Lynn's comments, but I—I I mean, if we we know we're almost at a non-starter, we don't you know we don't have a great uh, comfort level of what we can do. I, I think we should be exploring what to do, but to go all the way and pull that trigger and then say a year later we get the data that we need. I, I, I you know I'm not sure how comfortable I am in that, but did did you get far enough to? you know, as a group to say what comfort level you have on on an assessment that, that should be, you know, able to pass peer review. Um, so having been a member of the stock assessment subcommittee, um, I can say that we had reviewed the available, you know, fishery dependent data. Um, one of the big hurdles with this assessment is going to be an index of abundance. So in the past, they had used the headboat survey, um, which even in the last assessment, they had to remove the last two years because of the federal fishery closures. Um, the Science Center indicated we shouldn't use that survey going forward. Um, so we had been exploring a couple alternatives. Um, the lead sort of index at that time was probably an MRIP fishery dependent index if we could somehow figure out a modification to account for technology creep um, and people, you know, through time, there's definitely been a growing interest and in ability to target these fish. Um, so that was about where we were when we got the notice from the center. Um, so I think if we can develop an index, probably a similar model to what was run last time could be accomplished. Um, if not, we would be exploring some more data poor options. You follow up, Jeff? Yes, thank you. Follow up. <clears throat> um, you know, in that case, if if what we're talking about is kind of like an MRIP CPUE or some sort of, you know, just MRIP based index, I would say I would be happy to wait for the recalibrated MRIP to get a full on peer review, but use that, you know, that MRIP um, index as guidance in the meantime, you know, have that presented, maybe even a, um, a desktop peer review by, by some folks like we've done with Red Drum in the past as some guidance. But, um, you know, I hate to put forth all the effort and then a year down the line say, well, now we've got the recalibrated MRF estimates. So Bob, you clear on this? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it sounds like we circle back around to we, we we're, we're sort of going to wait on see what happens with the science center uh, with their staffing and then uh, I mean we had a, basically at a total standstill until that person comes on board so it basically we're at a standstill uh, and you know it's it sounds like you know it's going to be important to to know what we're dealing with in terms of the inputs. Um, so I did see another hand. Ben, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and likely might not be able to be answered, but just something to think about. I know that we're talking about um, conflicts of, of uh, assessments and two and timing uh, 
time and limit ability for to be able to conduct multiple assessments from even the science center. Um, are we confident that that is the only hurdle moving forward to get it started again? Is the <clears throat> is someone getting rehired, or a year later from now, are we going to find ourselves potentially having to compete with other assessments that have been started by that time? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Ben. Um, in short, our understanding from NIMS uh, and the Southeast Center is COBIA remains, you know, top priority. Um, the CDAR steering committee, which sets the schedule there for the, the Southeast, meets every uh, six months. They'll meet again late winter, and so that'll be the next opportunity to confirm that. But everything we've heard um, since this staffing change is that COBIA remains a priority. Okay. I, I think we've got general agreement that we'll let this play out as it is. And, uh, you know, just FYI, we'll, this board will probably not need to meet any time in the near future. Uh, but we can certainly figure out a proper venue to provide updates on this, even if it's not a full uh, Pelagic's board meeting, you know, at uh, one of our other policy board meetings or something, just keep everybody updated on this. So. Everybody comfortable with that? Okay, very good. All right, we'll move along. Our next item is to consider the 2025 Atlantic Cobia Regional Recreational Measures, and I'm going to call on Angela to give a TC uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the first presentation I have for you today, as mentioned, is on potential recreational management measures for the Northern region starting in 2025. Um, going back through time a little bit, um, at our last, at the last Coastal Pelagics Board meeting, um, Addendum 2 was approved, and per Addendum 2, rather than managing, uh, the catches at a state-by-state -state target level, um, we are now managing the coastwide recreational harvest between two regions, a northern region that includes Virginia North, which is allocated 68.7% of our coastwide quota, recreational quota, and the southern region, which is allocated 31.3%. Um, and again, these new allocation rates, uh, targets, harvest targets are under the current coastwide quota of 76,908 fish on the recreational side. Um, an additional change with addendum two was that we can now evaluate harvest against the harvest targets for up to five years of data. Um, however, given uh, the current regulatory changes that occurred in 2021, uh, for this, we evaluated each region's average harvest across 2021 to 2023 against its target to see if uh, reductions were necessary in 2025. So this table shows first the recreational harvest targets with the new allocation scheme for the northern and southern region. Starting with the northern region, the new harvest target is 52,825 fish. Based on the 2021 through 2023 average recreational harvest, uh, we are about 10,000 fish over the target, which means that the northern region would be required to take a 15.9% reduction to bring us back to the recreational harvest target level. The southern region, the recreational harvest target is now 24,083 fish. And the average recreational harvest over that three year time period was 23,474 fish. So given that's under target, uh, the southern region can maintain status quo management measures, um, either until a management change is required with a reduction or uh, the completion of the CR95 stock assessment. So in addendum two, it specifies that in order for us to implement this 15.9% reduction, um, we currently within the region have to get all of the states onto the si same size and vessel limits. Um, however, seasons are allowed to vary across the coast due to the migratory nature of cobia through the summertime. Um, the FMP also specifies that the minimum size limit cannot be below 40 inches total length or 36 inches fork length. So if we look at our current regulations, 
um, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island are currently under the de minimis regulations that were allowed in the previous amendment or addendum. Um, so they all have a 37 inch total length size limit with a one fish vessel limit and are open all year long. Um, as an alternative de minimis measure, Maryland and PRFC um, have uh, matched Virginia's regulations, which is a 40 inch total length minimum size limit with a two fish vessel limit and a season that's open from June 15th to September 15th. And it should be noted here that Virginia's regs also are currently a little bit more conservative with only allowing one of those two fish per vessel to be over 50 inches. Um, however, that regulation is not one that was carried over to Maryland or the Potomac River. So the first step in all of this is basically for the technical committee to develop methods to address changing either size limits, the vessel limit, or the season lengths to achieve that reduction or some combination of those options. Um, as it's been used for other species as well as Kobe in the past, um, there's an equation we use to combine these different reduction methods in order to estimate what the cumulative reduction would be. And this is basically done so that we're not double counting fish, we're not saving a fish with the size limit change as well as the vessel limit change but only counting that fish once. Um, so for all of these analyses, the EMRIC data was pooled for 2021, 2022, and 2023. Again, because that is the time period when regulations have been consistent since the last changes. So as I mentioned earlier, the first thing with addendum two is that all states are required to have at least a 40 inch total length minimum size limit. So that would require that Delaware through Rhode Island increase their minimum size from 37 inches total length to at least 40. Um, the technical committee considered ways to try giving credit for this increase in size limit, but there just really wasn't enough data. There were only a handful of fish lengths collected by MRIP for Delaware through Rhode Island in those three years. And at least on the initial look at it, um, all of the fish were over 40 inches already. Um, so there is no credit given to that as far as we are able to quantify. Um, and the second part of this then was using the MRIP length frequencies for all states in the region. So in this case, Virginia through Rhode Island to explore the various size limit options. So we're assuming all states start at the minimum 40 inch size limit. Um, we did end up including both imputed and non-imputed lengths in this analysis due to sample size issues again. Um, we had a much higher sample size with using some of those imputed lengths. Um, and these analyses do account for a 5% release mortality for any new discards that occur as a result of a right change. So if the region decides to implement a one fish vessel limit, um, we've just ended up calculating what that reduction would be using the Maryland and Virginia data. Um, and it should be noted here, the Potomac River, for those that aren't familiar with it, um, the landings estimated from that jurisdiction end up either in Maryland's estimate or Virginia's estimate, depending on whichever side of the river someone lands on and they're intercepted. So those are covered with just the Maryland and Virginia MREP data. Um, but basically we compiled the MREP trip intercept data to determine the number of fish harvested per vessel trip and the number of anglers. Um, and when we did this, we assumed that any trip that had previously harvested two fish would now, would, that trip would still occur, but they would just now harvest a single fish and release the other one. If the board decides that they would rather keep the two fish vessel limit for Maryland, Virginia, and PRC, that means that the states from Delaware through Rhode Island would increase their vessel limit from one fish to two fish. Um, again, there really wasn't sufficient MRIP data to calculate what that increase could be. Um, we had initially tried using methods used by North Carolina in the past that had intercepts where a fish was harvested as well as released, and we could now move that one of the released fish over as a harvested fish. But in this case, all of the intercepts, if they harvested a fish, they didn't release any cobia. So um, instead, what we're presenting to the board is a range of options, assuming either a lower bound where there's no change in the Delaware through Rhode Island harvest estimate with this vessel limit change, 
um, as well as a kind of upper bound where we basically just doubled the harvest that we have observed in the past. And then the average between those two would be an increase of 1.3%. Um, all the tables you'll see later do use this two and a half upper bound scenario. Um, and that's really because it's kind of the, I don't want to say worst case scenario, but it's the higher end of it, what we would expect. Um, and there were really very few differences between using the upper bound or average when calculating options. It, um, the few that occurred are noted on the tables when we get there. And then lastly, for the season methods, um, we calculated season reductions only for the Maryland, Virginia, PRFC part of the region. Um, again, we don't have sufficient MREP data for states Delaware North. Um, so if any seasons are implemented in those states, they're not credited towards the reduction. Um, and, but again, the addendum does say that state seasons may differ between states and regions. So um, any reduction you see is just for a season change would be Maryland and Virginia only. Um, similar to past assessments or, or past changes and calculations, for the Maryland through Virginia season reductions, we calculated that over the three years by individual harvest date through the wave. Um, this is a little bit different than what we do for other species. Just because of the short seasons and pulse nature of these fisheries, there could be differences in catch rates either early in the season or towards the end of the season. It often only occurs for part of a wave when seasons may be open or fish are available. Um, so that's what was done for the reductions. Um, as mentioned earlier, when we looked at um, the vessel limit change of potentially Maryland through Virginia going to a one fish vessel limit, it overshot that 15.9% reduction. Um, so we did look into the possibility of increasing the season length to um, compensate for that. Um, and in this case, we just calculated a daily catch rate based off of the number of days the season was open over that time frame. Um, this does, however, mean that there is uncertainty due to those varying daily catch rates. Um, you know, if you're only adding a few days, there are, are going to be differences between weekends, weekdays, that sort of thing. And this daily rate kind of averages over all of that uncertainty. So before I present options, um, the TC does emphasize the sources of uncertainty and management considerations that the board should be thinking about as you contemplate which management options to implement. Um, the first is that the analysis assumes that fish availability, the size, length, frequencies, and the angler effort are the, are the same in future years as what we observed in 2021 through 2023. So if any of that changes, we could see different results in the future. Um, additionally, if Cobia's range continues to expand, more fish could become available to those northern states and harvest could increase despite management measures to reduce the harvest. Uh, the TC also discussed certain states seeing larger fish in general, particularly at the northern part of the range. So if some states do primarily see a larger fish, any sort of maximum slot limit could limit the available fish for harvest. As I just mentioned, the season expansion analysis assumes a constant daily harvest due to the lack of recent data outside of the current seasons. So that adds a little bit of uncertainty when you're looking to expand the season. Uh, the TC also had a long discussion about how difficult large cobia are to measure on the vessel. So it's possible that, you know, if you're having to get a fish on the boat to check the maximum size limit, or a much higher minimum size limit, there could be a result, or there could be injury to the fish, as well as resulting uh, increase in dead discards. Um, we also used the 5% discard mortality rate from the previous assessment, um, which I do not believe um, involved gaffing. So the effect of gaffing may not be fully captured in our assumed release mortality rate, though it should be noted that at least in the uh, northern region where Virginia makes up the bulk of the harvest, Virginia has had a ban on gaffing for cobia since 2021. Um, and the last thing the TC wanted to note was regarding Virginia's current size limit, which only allows for one fish of the two per vessel, be, vessel to be over 50 inches. 
Um, so as I mentioned, Virginia is the only state that has this rule and all of the length frequencies we use for the analysis um, include this caveat with the Virginia data. Um, and unsurprisingly, most of the data is coming out of Virginia, so that's where most of the harvest is. Um, so it's unclear if the board would want to implement this criteria for all states in the region. Um, if the provision's implemented for the entire region, there's the potential for anglers to start high grading. Um, if the provision is removed in favor of a slot limit with the two fish vessel limit, you know, something like the two fish harvested up to 53 inches, you have two large fish. There potentially could be more harvests of those larger fish. Um, however, it should be noted that in the years we looked at for 21 through 23, only about a third of the Maryland and Virginia trips were limiting out at the vessel level. Um, so it's overall, it's difficult to quantify what the impact of this regulation would be on the rest of the coast. So moving into the tables next after this slide, um, all of these management options are estimated to achieve at least the 15.9% reduction in the northern region. Each option has three components, the size limit, the vessel limit, and the season for Maryland, PRC, and Virginia only. Um, and it should be noted this isn't an exhaustive list. It was kind of a summary list of what options we thought were viable, but the technical committee can provide other combinations of size limits and seasons um, if there's something in particular the board is interested in. So splitting up across two slides, this first slide, the first option basically is the one that reduces the vessel limit to one fish and allows for a slightly expanded fishing season of about one week. Um, and it maintains the 40 inch minimum size limit. Um, the second option keeps that 40 inch minimum size as well as the two fish vessel limit that's currently in place for Maryland through Virginia, but reduces the season length either on the front end or the back end. That's the 16.7 is if you reduce the back end to August 25th versus reducing the season in the beginning of the year um, at June 30th, that's the 24.4% reduction. Uh, options three through four on this slide increase the minimum size as well as reduce the season length. And then option five raises the minimum size but maintains the current Maryland through Virginia seasons and the current two fish vessel limit at 43 inches. Um, on this last slide, it gets into all of the various slot options that the TC considered. Uh, these top four options, again, all have the two fish vessel limit and maintain that 40 inch minimum size limit. Uh, the first one is the slot limit needed to maintain the current season dates. Um, and then the second through fourth options differ by adjusting the upper size limit as well as the seasons. And then these last two options on here uh, also increase the minimum size limit as well as put that maximum size limit on, but are able to maintain the June 15th through September 15th season for Maryland through Virginia. And so those are the options the technical committee prepared for your consideration today. Um, and at this point, I can take any questions on the methods, though I will say Emily will be presenting timeline. So anything related to that will come up next. Thank you, Angela. So questions for Angela on the TC's evaluation. Jay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thanks, Angela. Um, great presentation and it's as you're kind of as I was reading the memo and as you're going through that I'm like having flashbacks of summer flounder scup black sea bass it's that kind of trying to cobble together from scraps of data that that you have um, and you guys did a nice job with it so good job um, I think you know what I was wondering is if you explored um, so I'll go back to fluke scup black sea bass and during like the most recent i don't know year year and a half um some modeling approaches to doing this stuff uh have been investigated so there's like a super fancy the rdm model um that they run uh, out of the science center and then there was a simpler approach that was proposed at the same time that just used gam models so i wondered if if you guys had explored there may not be enough data for the like you know the the fancy model 
I'm, I think there is enough data to run the GAMS to do a modeling approach. And just to offer why um, I'm suggesting this, you know, when you piece these things together, they actually interact. Um, you know, if you change the bag and change the season, there's like an interaction between those two things, which when you're doing them separately, it's not accounted for. So maybe you did account for it. We used to have this little equation that we would kind of use. Um, but I think a, a better way to do it is through a modeling approach that's integrating everything. So, um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so currently the way we are accounting for it is the little equation you referenced, um, which essentially is looking at, you know, the overlap between two percentages to remove that overlap. Um, we have not explored a modeling approach. I know I've heard that discussed for other species, but that has not come up on the COBIA TC at this point, but could be something to look into. All right, any other questions for Angela before I go to Emily on the the timeline. All right, seeing none, Emily, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I will um, just go over the um, potential timelines. Uh, we got some questions from board members on how this process would work and what the timeline would be. So um, staff put together a couple of possible timelines for your consideration, but also this is a board decision. So if the board has other timelines in mind, um, you know, it's up to the board. So um, again, you know, this is a board decision for these northern region measures on when to actually select the measures and what date in 2025 to implement those measures. Um, and just also a note, the board can specify that these northern region measures uh, would be in place for 25 and 26 to align with our current coastwide recreational quota, which is in place through um, 2026. So this first possible timeline would be for the board to actually select the northern region measures today. And in that case, the northern the states in the northern region would submit implementation plans by a specified date, and the board could review those implementation plans via email vote. The next possible timeline, uh, timeline two, would be that the board approves the TC methodology today, um, and then the states in the northern region could take some time after the meeting today to coordinate and consider the options. And then if all the states in the northern region can come to a consensus on which measures to implement, the states could submit implementation plans by a specified date for the board to consider via email vote. And this would be, you know, if the full board was comfortable with this approach of, you know, letting the northern states come to that agreement outside of a full board meeting based on the, the suite of options from the TC and then providing their final implementation plans to the full board. And then the third possible timeline is similar. Um, states could take some time after this meeting to consider the options. However, if the um, states in the northern region cannot come to consensus, then we would need to schedule a full board meeting via webinar to uh, vote on which measures to implement for the northern region. And again, if the board has other timelines in mind, um, that would be a board decision. So happy to take any questions. All right, thanks. Questions for Emily? And on that, any? Okay, with no questions, then uh, from Doug. Uh, and this is, I know that we've talked about this at previous meetings, but I want to make sure I understand is conservation equivalency for those? states still in play after they agree on a common set or is conservation equivalency off the table? So conservation equivalency is off the table. Um, yes, as discussed for addendum two, you know, the objective of this regional management is to have the consistent vessel and size limits. So states cannot deviate from whichever set of options is selected. But the state, the seasons can vary, of course, but they can't deviate from their, the vessel or size limits. Follow up, Doug. Well, okay, thank you. And I, I thought that was it, but I wanted to make sure. But go back to that last slide you had up. I just want to make sure I understand what that slide is saying. It's saying that if the northern um, portion of this can agree, then they make their own decision. 
But if they can't, then it comes to the full board and this end of the table gets involved at that point, right? Right, at that point, it would be a full board vote uh, if the states cannot come to consensus. No, I just want to keep that in mind. Thank you. All right, uh, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so um, just to make sure I'm understanding uh, the difference between two and three is is just that um, three is explicit about what happens if there's like lack of agreement amongst the northern states. It kind of defines what would happen after that. But timeline three is also inclusive of timeline two. Like if we do come to a consensus, then it's it, that's fine. Right. So maybe the labeling of two and three as separate options is confusing, but they're essentially the same option where the states have time after this meeting to consider measures. And if the states can come to consensus, then the states can just submit their full their implementation plans to the board via email. But if the states can't come to consensus, then we need to have another board meeting to um, vote on those measures. All right. This is all. Lynn, is that? <laughs> are you sure? Go on. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to clarify when you said you can have different seasons, that includes no season, right? It can just be open continuously, but we will have to change the size limit, even though it can't be measured what difference we're having as de minimis states. <laughs> Correct. Correct. So a state can have a, a the any sorry any state besides Maryland and Virginia could have a year round season or any season because we can't quantify that. And correct, we can't quantify that jump for Rhode Island through Delaware for that thirty seven to forty. Having a little buyer's remorse there, John. <laughs> so, just being a crotchety old bureaucrat, hating hating to have to change a regulation yet again. For species, no one's catching. Yes, I understand. Okay. All right, but the the board does have to uh, give some guidance here. What you know, if you've got an alternative outside of these three, describe it. If if you know one of these uh, seems to be the uh, best choice, uh, Mr. Gear. Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to make a motion. Good. Uh, well, <laughs> and I think the staff be. have it at this point. It can be displayed and read it into the record, and we'll hopefully get a second. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to have to modify a couple places on there, but um, move to approve COBIA Technical Committee methodology for the develop, developing correctional management options to meet the northern region reduction. That's timeline option number two. Um, states in the northern region will select a set of measures for the 2025, 2026, and submit implementation plans for the board consideration by January 1, 2025. So where it says month, okay, that's gonna be January 1, 2025. Got that. And then states in the Northern region must implement the new measures by April 1, 2025. And if the states in the northern region cannot come to consensus on which measures to implement, a virtual board meeting will be scheduled to select measures. If I get a second, I'll. I have a second. Uh, Joe Semino, second. Um, just a, a, a question before we get into discussion. So um, this didn't really come up before, but if there was, if it required a virtual board meeting, um, do we want to put in there a time certain for implementation of the measures, regardless of whether it's a consensus or a board deliberation? Is that, or do we leave that open ended? I have confidence in my fellow commissioners that we are going to reach consensus on this. Well, I appreciate confidence. <clears throat> a good thing. Okay. So, discussion on the motion. Uh, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so um, this 
motion, uh, I think we're kind of looking at the suite of options. So I'll back up. The timelines seem to imply that, or, or something <laughs> in there implied that, you know, we were kind of locked into the, the um, options that the technical committee put together. Uh, does that preclude somebody like coming forward with, you know, some other um, type of, of analysis to kind of look at that? And I'm fine if it does. I just want to be sure and, and not do some work if it, it's going to get ignored. Yeah. yeah, so this would approve the TC methodology that Angela just presented. So any different methodology would not be considered at this point. Okay. Further discussion? Any questions for clarification? Joe? I mean, I just, I'm supportive of the the timeline because I think, you know, the, there's some big changes coming for the northern states. Um, I think the sooner that we can uh, put forth what options are going to be, or, you know, w what regulations will be coming, I think is very important. So, um, I, I, I think, but to your question, if if it even came to a virtual board meeting, I would still hope for an April 1 implementation date. All right, I just wanted to make sure that's understood because it's not specifically stated in there. So, all right, any further discussion? All right, do we need to caucus on this before a vote? Any need for caucusing? Don't see any heads nodding. Yes, so we're going to assume no. So I'm going to call the question. Uh, any opposition to this motion? We'll try it that way first. All right. Seeing none. Is there any abstentions? We have South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida abstaining. Uh, need no votes. Okay. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, Pat, for that. Appreciate that. Anything further on that, Emily? Okay. Just a question. So, uh, whose house are y'all all meeting at to sort this out? You know. <laughs> Good point. Um, we'll we'll organize the meeting. We'll we'll set up that meeting with everybody. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Well, we'll move along on our agenda here. Um, and go back to Angela. You know, one of the things in the recently approved addendum was uh, consideration of a confidence interval approach to looking at the uh, variability and the uh, MRIP estimates. And so uh, we've got a technical committee report on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so moving into this agenda item at the last board meeting, uh, the technical committee was tasked to uh, discuss this confidence interval approach and its potential application to the new regional allocations that were approved at the last board meeting. Um, and as part of this task, um, we are also tasked with a discussion of other confidence interval levels in addition to the 95% confidence interval that was referenced in addendum two. So again, a refresher, though we covered part of this with the last presentation. Um, currently, we use a rolling average approach. Um, so each region's average recreational landings are evaluated against a regional target. Previously, this was a three-year timeline, but under addendum two now, we're averaging up to five years of data that have been under the same management measures. Um, and if a region's average landings exceed the target, the region must adjust measures to reduce harvest to the target level um, if a region's annual harvest is below the target for at least two consecutive years, that region may liberalize as long as they are not estimated to exceed the target. In addendum two, there's a provision that the board can vote to switch from the current rolling average approach to this confidence interval approach for harvest target evaluations. And the intention here was basically to more directly account for the uncertainty around the MRIP point estimates using the confidence intervals. Um, so instead of comparing the rolling average harvest against the target, we would compare the 95% confidence intervals to the harvest target each year. Um, though again, similar to the current rolling average approach, the evaluation period would include up to five years, assuming the same management measures were in place. 
So in this provision, it says that if the entire confidence interval is above the harvest target for a majority of the years, the harvest is estimated to have been above the target and the region must take a reduction. Alternatively, if the entire confidence interval is below the target for a majority of years, the harvest has, is then estimated to have been below the target and the region could liberalize. However, if the harvest target falls within the confidence interval for the majority of the years, the region maintains status quo measures. Um, and then ultimately, however, you know, if the confidence interval evaluation indicates that actions needed, the average landings are still used to calculate that percent reduction needed. Um, reduction or liberalization relative to the target. Uh, I know on the PDT there was some discussion about what the majority of years means. Um, so in this case, if we had five years, it could be three out of five years or two out of three years would count as a majority. Um, if it's split evenly, such as two out of four years or one out of two years, then the technical committee would recommend management action. Uh, this confidence interval provision also tr tried to align with the MRIP recommendations. Um, so years with PSEs greater than 50, with those estimates being having high PSE values, would be excluded from the evaluation. And years with PSEs between 30 to 50, which MRIP recommends using with caution, would be reviewed by the TC to determine whether to include the evalu them in the evaluation. So the technical committee applied the confidence interval approach to the current 2021 through 2023 evaluation period, um, as well as the previous 2017 through 2019 period, which is the last time we evaluated measures. Um, it should be noted that, you know, that earlier time period in 2017 through 2019, the evaluation was still state by state. So the technical committee assumed the regional framework was in place for the exercise. Um, and just to give you a range of what the options might look like, in addition to the 95% confidence interval, we also examined the 90%, 85%, 80%, and a 50% confidence interval just to explore a large range for you guys. Um, while the technical committee doesn't um, have any final recommendations at this point, we do have some observations and initial input, input for the board. So just as an example of what we're looking at here when we're discussing confidence intervals, uh, the example here is for the 2022 Virginia through Maine estimate of cobia harvest with its PSE of 23.7. Um, so you can see here, the point estimate is a harvest value of 43,841 fish. Um, essentially what the confidence interval is telling us is that we are 95% sure that the actual harvest value is somewhere within that range. So in other words, if the surveys were conducted repeatedly over and over again, the resulting confidence intervals would include the true population value 95% of the time. So in this case for 95%, confidence interval, we expect that the harvest estimate lies somewhere between 23,495 fish up to 64,187 fish. Um, you'll see with the 80% confidence interval, you still have that same point estimate of 43,841 fish, but now that confidence range is smaller. So the 80% confidence interval only goes from 30,533 fish up to 57,149 fish. So you see that throughout the presentation when we look at some of the graphs on the next slides that as we have smaller confidence intervals, those error bars are getting smaller on the estimates. So looking at the northern regions, um, again, these two orangish red colored lines on here are the three year evaluation periods for 2017 through 19 and 2021 through 2023. Um, in the past using or as what we currently do, I shouldn't say in the past, using the current methods, um, using the rolling average approach, both time of these time periods were shown to be above the harvest target and reductions were, were taken or will be taken. Um, and so in both periods, the 95% confidence intervals are the broadest um, and showed that status quo measures could be maintained. So you'll see that across those lines, those confidence intervals the majority of the years are crossing the error bars. Um, the smaller confidence intervals used during the 27 through 2019 period, however, you can see it particularly well, I think on the 85% one, um, show that while that reductions would be needed. Um, and then in the more recent time period, given the uncertainty with the data, status quo measures could be maintained. 
across all of the various confidence interval uh, options that we looked at. Uh, for the Southern model, the current approach would have allowed for liberalization in the 2017 through 2019 period and status quo for the 2021 through 23 period. Um, and as with the Northern analysis, the 95% confidence interval was the most likely to result in a status quo, um, a status quo recommendation, while liberalization was far more likely to be supported when using smaller confidence intervals in the 2017 through 2019 period. So some initial technical committee observations, as I just said, the 95% confidence intervals are fairly large due to the uncertainties in the COBIA data being used. Um, and using those 95% confidence intervals would most likely result in less frequent management changes, so more status quo determinations. Um, so while the current rolling average approach doesn't account for the data uncertainties directly, it does allow for quicker response to changes in harvest through time. Uh, so as I mentioned before, many of these confidence interval approaches that we evaluated outside of those 95% confidence intervals resulted in similar uh, management advice on whether to reduce or liberalize um, compared to our current um, our current methods. Um, the one real big difference here would be the northern region for 2021 through 2023, where basically any of the confidence interval approaches would um, suggest that we should stay status quo rather than taking a reduction as we currently are doing with the rolling average approach. You didn't see um, a similar determination until it got down to a 50% confidence interval. So as, the, as I mentioned before, the technical committee doesn't have a final recommendation on this approach at this time, but had some initial observations and input for the board. Um, the first was to consider how the board's management goals for the harvest evaluations, well, consider what your management goals are and how the harvest evaluations could factor into that, um, as well as how responsive you would like to be. And some of this, I think, you know, the technical committee felt could be dependent on other factors. We were just talking about the frequency of stock assessments and what's going on with the current stock assessment. Um, so in a case where the average harvest exceeds the target for a number of years and the time between assessments is long, the board may want to be more responsive given the infrequent updates on stock status. Um, and also just to note that this confidence interval approach would still require a number of technical committee decisions um, as even though we've now reduced our PSEs by, you know, aggregating the MREP data to regions, there are still a number of years that have PSEs between 30 and 50. And it would be up to the technical committee to decide whether to include that year in the evaluation. So this is just a table showing what the regional PSEs look like for the northern and southern region. And all the yellow ones highlighted there are ones between 30 and 50. So the technical committee would like some more time to consider this approach. Um, and also to get some feedback from the board on how the rolling average and confidence interval approaches would align with their management goals for the stock. So with that, I can take any questions. Thank you, Angela. Questions for Angela? Don't see any. Uh, Jay? Yeah, <clears throat> I hesitated raising my hand because I'm not sure that this is an actual question, but I'll, I'll go for it anyways. Um, so thank you for this work. I, it was really informative and it's, I always find that interesting. So we have this approach, the averaging approach, it's meant to account sort of like a hack to account for uh, the uncertainty, um, but you know, kind of on its face, it's a hack. And so you, let's get refined. Let's look at the confidence intervals and see how that performs. And lo and behold, they kind of both work, you know, the same you know, depending on which level uh, you take. So I, I always kind of get a kick out of that anyways. Um, but thank you for the work. It's good work. Um, I agree with some of the the recommendations first that when you do something like this, you kind of have some information, but you don't know what you're shooting for. So it's just kind of information that's hanging um, out there. And, and so I think one it's kind of like an implied metric is a notion of stability, like how many times would we have had to change? Um, and so that's kind of how I viewed the information. And it looks like it's pretty much, you know, um, you have to get really, you have to really kind of collapse in on, on the distribution to 
um, get it to actually react because the confidence intervals are so large to begin with. Um, so that's useful, um, useful information. And, and that recommendation, I, I think, is a good one from the technical committee as well. That it depends on what you want. It, you know, if you want it to be more responsive, then you'd pick the 50% or somewhere between there and 80 or something like that. Um, I guess I'm struggling. I, I think we should keep pursuing this. I, I like the approach. Um, I'm struggling a little bit to um, understand how we hone in on getting the technical committee the information that they need to be able to provide us with judgments about these different things. Um, you know, I think it would it could take a bunch of different forms like a survey of the board or um, but I, I don't know. I, I just I think to pursue this further, they need a little more guidance from the board as to what we're looking for. So stability could be one feature and then they would be able to tell us, OK, this one provides the most stability, the 95 percent confidence interval. You never change. Um, but that might conflict with we also don't want to overfish and it, you kind of end up doing sort of like a mini management strategy evaluation basically is is what you're doing and i know that people don't like that word so i hesitated to use it but we don't have to do a really complicated one but i think to pursue this further we need to provide more mm -hmm. guidance so i'll kind of let that float out there and if i have any more definitive thoughts i'll offer them mr chair thank you thank you jay any other questions uh, comments in response to this go ahead Jesse. thank you mr chair um so i had a question so after we uh change measures for 25 we'll just have uh, one year data to work with uh, the following year. So whether we use confidence inter interval approach or the average approach, um, right? Those both kind of assume that there's some length of time to look at an average or multi majority of years. So um, when we come back next year to look at the harvest uh, and compare it to the to the target on uh, the addendum, it says uh, you know you're required to adjust measures if you're above the target. So when you only have one year of data, are we still required to do that? Or assuming, say, it's all above above the target, or is that um, just kind of board discretion at that time? Yeah, thanks for that question. So just to expand on this scenario, so the current specifications end in 2026. So the board will have to consider setting specifications and um, recreational measures starting in 27. So we'll be doing that at the end of 26. So we'll be looking back at data from 2025 prior. And since we were doing a management change in 25, we'll only have that one year of data. So I think that's a question for the board to ponder because I'm not sure when the original FMP was developed, there was much thought about the scenario of what if we only have one year of data, whether we're using the average approach or the confidence interval approach. So I think that's a helpful thing to point out at this point that once we get to 2026 and the board is thinking about 2027, we're gonna be in a little bit of a conundrum because we'll only have one year of data based on this next management change. So I think that will take some future discussion of the board to think about how we move forward for 2027. Lynn, see if you can figure that out. Go ahead and get ready for <laughs> That's gonna fall squarely in your lap, I'm afraid, as, as chair. So um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it is something we need to be thinking about. So Jay? Yeah, um, Emily, can I ask you a little more about that? So. Um, in that case, is the idea that the averaging approach wouldn't work, but the confidence interval approach could work because you have that in the single year, correct? So I think theoretically, yes. But uh, again, I think this is a scenario that maybe the original FMP didn't have the confidence interval approach. So I think just in general, the scenario of only having one year of data 
wasn't really considered. And so I think it would be up to the board to think about, you know, would using the confidence interval approach for just one year, I think it could, you know, that could functionally work, but it would the board be comfortable with that? I think we're going to have to have some more discussion on how to proceed. And I think you run the possibility of the high PSE just qualifying so, so much uh, data that it just you don't even have anything to work with. Um, Lynn? Yeah, thanks. And I, I appreciate the the punt over there. Um, so we just had a conversation about the stock assessment and its delay. Um, and I think somebody said, and maybe it was Joe said that this could, the delay of the stock assessment might put us into status quo, maybe for longer than we might want to be. So in 20, so maybe a lot of this comes back around to when that assessment becomes available. Because if we reach 26 and we're trying to set specifications, maybe what this forces us into, we don't have a new stock assessment. We don't know what would drive those new specifications. That it's just going to run us into extending our status quo measures for a little bit longer until we can implement either a PSE technique with that works or rolling average technique and also work on getting those assessments. So I don't, I don't know if I'm making sense, but it seems like there's an interplay here that at the end of the day, we might find ourselves just in protracted status quo while we get our, our ducks in a row with the assessment and the confidence interval or PSC approach or rolling average approach, sorry. No, I, I think that's an accurate characterization of the future is that we've, we've got a lot of balls in the air that all need to come to hand before we can really make the kind of informed decision that we need to make. Lynn? Yeah, thanks. So I guess my follow-up to that, sort of the, the conclusion I never reached was maybe when we have more information on when the assessment's coming through, maybe that's a time when the board could make a decision how it wants to go forward. And potentially, so if we understand that the assessment is going to be delayed till 2028, the board can take action to extend our specifications till that time. So that was kind of the conclusion I was aiming for, but never got to. Right. Uh, we're certainly not at a decision point now. You know, we, we, we've got things that have to play out before we know know enough to make an informed decision. So, again, thanks. Angela for that. And and I do think, you know, we continue to need to be thinking about, you know, if we're going to use this confidence interval approach, where, where do we want those boundaries to be set, you know, in terms of our comfort? Because, you know, it, it all comes back to the old perennial balance of risk versus uncertainty, like it always seems to do. And, and uh, Kobe is certainly a poster child for the challenges of that, you know, pulse fishery. Um, catch estimates with high uncertainty. So um, any further discussion on that topic? If not, we'll move along. I'm gonna call on John Carmichael for an update on our Atlantic Coast uh, macro port meetings. All right, yes, thank you, Spud. Um, <clears throat> so we continue with the port meetings. We've held them recently in Florida, um, had them um, in South Carolina as well, which were rescheduled, um, pretty good, turnout in the more southern ones in florida i think uh, north carolina is probably still leading in terms of the number of fishermen who showed up um the last round is coming up in the mid-atlantic which would be november 18th in virginia beach the 19th in whitestone the 20th in ocean city and 21st in manahawken so really appreciate the efforts everybody's put into through this as we work through these port meetings to help spread the word encourage your fishermen to get there and get this input. And it's been really great input through the process, that's for sure. Um, there's a lot of interest by those fishermen. They're very engaged. So the next steps is we're planning to review the report from all the meetings at the March 2025 council meeting. And then at that point, the intent is to begin an amendment, which would look at the fishery really comprehensively, looking at the goals and objectives of the amendment, they're looking at catch limits for Spanish mackerel, the other management changes that um, might be needed. And we're expecting there'll be a Macrocobia AP meeting in the spring to review the report. And at some point, we may want to consider if there's value in getting the council's advisors and the ASMFC advisors together and somehow to provide input on this and go through the amendment. That's something we can certainly uh, work out at the staff level. 
And information on all these is on the council website for those that are uh, interested in following along and, and hopefully attending. So I know we're working on getting folks there. Thanks, thanks, John. Any any questions for John on that? Uh, Emily. Yeah, just for states in the Mid Atlantic, I'll be reaching out next week. Uh, the council staff passed along some outreach materials that I will share with you. So once the council initiates action on this addendum, then we'll have to start contemplating what our response is going to be to synchronize our activities and uh, just as a reminder we, we've got a stock status determination uh, and some catch level advice that's going to require some potentially unpleasant changes so that's something we're going to be facing um, in the not too distant future so thank you john and thanks to everybody at the states and, and at the commission and the council that have put these meetings together i attended uh, one in coastal Georgia, and it, it was an interesting opportunity to get people to just talk about their perspective on things. And there were some some common themes that emerged out of it that I think are pretty illuminating in terms of how people perceive the abundance of of fish and changes in the ecosystem. So, um, at this point, is there any other business to come before the Pelagics Board? Seeing none, then we'll adjourn.